What's up guys? We have a fantastic webinar for you today. You know I love talking to high performance building and high performance HVAC, ooh, one of my favorite nerdy topics. And speaking of nerdy topics and nerdy friends, I have them all with me today, guys. Are you ready? We got a fun webinar. Let me introduce you to the other friends I've got with me. Christoph Irwin, we go a long ways back. I've introduced Christoph many times, we've been in many videos, and I typically call you my mechanical designer, uh, and uh, Positive Energy is your company, but you guys do more than just mechanical design, Christoph. Give us uh, 30 seconds on what Positive Energy does. Will do, so as we know, building a science is systems of systems, so we're looking at the uh, design process itself as a system that can be optimized, and what that means is really early on, we're doing modeling and performance optimization of the enclosures, the resilient systems. So every home today needs an energy and water system and a backup plan for it. And we're doing, of course, full service, not just M anymore, but electrical and plumbing designs. Christoph and I have been working together for probably a dozen, 13 years now, doing all of my uh, mechanical designs. Amazing firm, and they've grown a ton over the years. I appreciate your partnership over the years. And from the carrier side, which is our sponsor today, I've got some really smart carrier guys here. Justin Ritchie, first off, we probably go back about a dozen years as well. We've been friends yeah. for a long time talking about high performance HVAC. Real close to that, man. Thankful and to be And Justin's here based you. here in Texas. And then I've also got Dave Foster, who flew in from the Pacific Northwest. And these guys are really going to help us get into the nitty gritty on the carrier side. Now, we are coming to you from the Carrier Training Center here in Austin, Texas. This is part of Robert Madden Industries, which is the local carrier distributor in this area. And believe it or not, my office is literally like a mile and a half from here. So this was awesome. My travel time was almost zero for today's webinar. Now, if you're watching this live, um, know that there's a Q&A tab under your screen for this webinar. And as we're talking today, I want you to throw your questions that come up in that Q&A tab. We're gonna go for about 45 minutes. And at the end, the last 15 minutes, we're gonna reserve specifically for your Q&A time. It's not often you get a guy like Christoph uh, in the room that you can ask questions. And of course, the three of us will be uh, here as well uh, to answer whatever you've got on carrier and HVAC on whatever systems we talk about. If you're watching this in a uh, pre-recorded session on Build Show Network, Make sure you sign up in the future for these. These are great live events, and this is not uh, this is not going to be edited. We're we're totally live, so anything can happen. With that being said, let's get going on the program. The first thing I actually want to jump into is since we're at the Carrier Training Center, we filmed a video yesterday with Justin and Dave, kind of talking to you about all these really cool systems that you see behind us here. Let's jump to that video and we're gonna give you a little bit of an intro on what carrier options are out there when it comes to VRF and ductless. Justin Ritchie and Dave Foster here with Carrier Corporation. We're at Robert Madden Industries facility in Austin, Texas. Today we're gonna to give you a quick 360 overview of our ductless product line and then touch on our single phase VRF. So we're gonna mask up, we're gonna get a little close here and dive into the equipment. Dave, you want to dive into the first ductless system over there? You bet. Thanks, Justin. So the first thing we're going to talk about is our multi-poised air handler. This probably looks familiar to you. This is a, an air handler that's a custom, uh, very similar to what you've installed in the past. But what's different about this is it matches up to our ductless system. And what's beautiful about that is that it it's basically receives power from the outdoor unit. Um, you, it has a built-in uh, interface, so you can have uh, the Ecobee thermostat on this. You can even add heat strips to it if you want. What we love about it too is the static pressure capabilities, up to 0.8 inches of static pressure available with this unit. And if you look down here at the bottom, here's our solution for IAQ. We can have our Infinity Air Purifier system uh, installed with this system. So really now what we're starting to see is whole home solutions with this system. Justin, you want to add anything to this? Yeah, one other thing to add about this system that's amazing. You know, normally with heat pumps, you start seeing the capacities fall off, you know, when you get around freezing or even before freezing freezing. With this system that you have right here in the two ton new performance outdoor unit paired with this, you almost have 100%, just slightly less than 100% capacity at negative four degrees outside and heating. That is so, fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. That. That's amazing. So if you're on propane in the country or you don't have access to natural gas, think about what this will save you. 
So right here we have another air handler, and believe it or not, this is customarily involved in a horizontal uh, position for most of our competition, but with Carrier, you can see that you can have a slim ducted unit installed in a vertical position. Uh, this is our 40 MBD slim ducted unit. It comes in multiple sizes, but the unique feature is that this can fit in a very tight space in a furred in wall um, and you know lots of different unique architectural applications like that. Absolutely, yeah, it adds a lot of value to be able to you know, feature architectural features that you normally wouldn't be with, able to do with traditional ducted systems. And you can also have cool aspects as far as how you would entertain and use the space due to having this individual comfort zones. Dave, you want to take it on next? Yeah, where are we going over here next? Yeah, let's go ahead and hit the multi-zone and then we'll hit on a few more heads. Our 38 MGR multi-zone, um, we absolutely love this unit. The capacity capabilities of this unit is off the charts. Uh, when we go by uh, nominal tonnage size, you, it doesn't even apply here. On a two and a half ton system, you're getting 42,000 BTUs on this system. Up to a four ton, five indoor units, and we're not using any branch boxes with this system. Very, very easy to install and great low ambient capabilities too, right Justin? Absolutely, yeah. And you know, you're gonna get your copper transitions for this, so your line transitions, so you don't have to buy those separately. Also, Dave mentioned that there's no branch box. So what that means for you contractors, you builders out there, you homeowners is, if you ever have a leak, it's gonna be very easy to find and fix versus chasing that leak throughout the house for hours. Up next, <laughs> up next is our floor console. You might have caught me moving a piece of uh, tool off of the top of this here. This, uh, what, what we love about this uh, unit here is you can see that it's, it normally installs low on the floor, fits in very tight spaces, it's a versatile unit, and nearly all the sizes, this, this is convertible and can go under ceiling as well. So you're starting to see a theme here with the carrier equipment, just like with our ducted unit, slim ducted unit, the versatility of application for any architectural design. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got a new cabinet. Dave, did you get to the new cabinet on this thing? I did not. So this is our 12,000 BTU. Our new cabinet is now in all the sizes above that. So the 18,000 BTU and above is in a metal cabinet. That metal cabinet also has the ability to be an under ceiling. So you're used to seeing this as a floor console. Looks kind of like a radiant heater that you would see in some older houses and so forth. But this one can sit under ceiling. And I've seen this applied in large spaces like barn dominiums and so forth, where you can have one on each side of the structure blowing into each other, and then you can have a cool architectural feature kind of sh um, hiding that unit in a sense with a fold down panel. So there's, so there's so many ways that you can get creative with this equipment. We really can't mention them all here. But n up next, we've got our most efficient uh, system right now and about this is the most efficient you can buy you yeah, can buy it's so. four, 42 sears justin said there's nothing more efficient on the market so when we talk about efficiency we're talking about cost of operation extremely efficient use of electricity and what you're looking at here is of course a high wall that's what people customarily think about with ductless and we've got three different high walls to choose from whether it's the high tier model here our brand new entry or mid tier model um, or our entry tier model the features and benefits uh, on these are fantastic we have dehumidification capabilities, occupancy sensor capabilities, and even like on this one here, the, the filter comes right off the top. Just beautiful, very easy. A lot of thought has gone into how to make these easy to service and install. In fact, Justin, you want to tell them about the blower motor? Yeah, blower absolutely. And you know, Dave was talking about how cool this new design is. We spent years looking at these systems here and getting feedback from the field, feedback from contractors. And that's one of the benefits about engineering in North America for the North American market, is we can take features like this and include it, which is a, a quality change for a contractor, but definitely for a homeowner. But let's dive into this unit real quick so you can see the inside. So on the inside, we've actually brought the electrical panel out front. So that makes it super easy to get access to the boards, make your electrical connections. You're gonna have one screw that you remove here, and then you have these four hasp and you unclip these four hasps and the blower wheel comes straight down to clean it. Which if you've ever had one of these units in your home and you've experienced a dirty blower wheel, being able to take that down and clean it in less than two minutes, that's a huge quality add. That's a feature add for you as a contractor and for you as a homeowner. And then Dave mentioned the relative humidity. So this has a relative humidity sensor in it and it has algorithms that will help optimize the performance of this unit to remove as much humidity as possible 
while holding it to within roughly to three degrees of set point. Yeah. No. And I want to jump in on that real quick because something that is subtle that maybe you picked up on looking at the coil is there's a gold fin coating on that coil. In fact, everything we've talked about today has this coating on it. And so when we're doing dehumidification and that coil is getting wet, that coating that we put on there standard on all of our models makes the water roll off of the coil very nicely. So it keeps the coil cleaner. Really, it's called a hydrophilic coating. Just Absolutely. a standard feature of carrier ductless. On all of our ductless products. Up next, we got something really cool to show y'all. So for you, those of you that have a gas furnace, you've seen this before, but you probably have never seen one paired with a mini split outdoor unit. So we're calling this our hybrid solutions. That's where we're taking conventional fan coils, conventional furnaces, util utilizing a 24 volt thermostat interface, and then bringing in the inverter ductless product to get the best of both worlds. So excellent option. We're also gonna have coil only options coming soon. So for you fo folks up north and in the Maple Leaf area <laughs> in Canada, you can pair that with a boiler as well, coming soon. Yeah, and so the cool thing you're seeing is that from Carrier, it's really, well, everything is coming together. Whether it's our residential equipment, our ductless equipment, everything's being integrated and working together. So from one company, you can get anything you need for any application. And we don't want to forget about our four-way cassette. So our four-way cassette is also in our ductless product line. And this is an opportunity where, let's say you don't want that wall mount on your wall and you want something that's going to be recessed in the center of the room that's going to be flush on your ceiling. This is a great option for you. And this is our smaller cabinet size. We also have it in a three foot by three foot size in the larger capacities. And this goes all the way up to four tons in capacity. What's nice about this, Justin, is that uh, you can service everything you need from right underneath. Uh, with the exception of the refrigerant and condensate on the outside here, um, all the electrical and the, the filter and everything is right underneath, so it's easy to service from inside of the home. Absolutely. And up next, we're gonna dive into the single phase VRF. Now, there's not enough time for us to cover the entire product line here, so we just wanna kinda of hit some highlights that would fit in with your residential type applications and so forth. So here we have our six ton simultaneous heat and cool. So this is a heat recovery system. With this, that means you can have one zone in heating, one zone in cooling at the same time, and you can recover that energy. You're gonna have a flow selector box. This flow selector box takes these different heads that you have throughout the space and it all comes into this box little magic box here and it's going to help switch these around have heat recovery in the box and you also have heat recovery in the outdoor unit and we are, i just want to interrupt you for a second because you're being you're such a humble polite guy i'm going to brag for a second we were the first in north america to come north america to come out with the heat recovery in single phase so i mean that's yeah. really a big deal yeah absolutely and, and this can be paired as a 12 ton unit and even as a 12 ton unit you're talking about this thing ramping all the way down to around a half a ton in capacity so huge operation range on this system also you've got all the flexibility of the vrf heads so you saw all the ductless heads Ductless heads are great for many applications, but if you need to go on longer line set stretches, or you need a situation where you need a lower capacity unit on a ducted unit and you need higher static, that's a great opportunity to look at VRF. You know, you really wanna pick the right tool for the job. So let's dive into a few heads that we're gonna look at. Actually up next, we've got our linear cassette. Now this linear cassette just came out. So this is really cool. You've got your one-way diffuser here. They're gonna blow out into the space. This actually goes all the way down to 5,000 BTUs too. So that's a really big deal because if you have a smaller room, you definitely wanna have the unit sized right for the space, which no doubt Matt and Christoph are gonna be talking about that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> huge. And just to jump in on what Justin was saying a moment ago, you know, with the ductless heads we just went over, you've got five to choose from. Here you've got 10, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have double the amount with single phase VRF on the Absolutely. Heads to choose yeah, from. you've got a lot more heads to choose from. Great products along the line. It's one of those that you really wanna get the right contractor for the job, pick the right piece of equipment for the job. So diving into some more of our condensing units. So we also have our carrier branded VRF. And we also have our Toshiba Carrier line. That heat recovery system that you saw, that was Toshiba Carrier. What you're looking at here, these are heat pumps, but they still give you the capability to go longer line set uh, links and also give you the capability of all those additional heads. So Dave, man, I think we've pretty much covered everything we can in this amount of time. You, we, we could have talked for another hour, I think. Absolutely, we could. But let's go ahead and kick it over to Matt and dive into some application talk. All right, we're back. Justin, Dave, 
<laughs> nice job, boys. Excellent video. You really gave us a tour. And I'm assuming you realize this, but everything they talked about is basically right behind us. We're in that same exact spot right now. So first off, let's transition or let's, uh, let's talk about this VRF, this ductless, this new style of equipment. And I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, why transition from what is traditional in American homes to this new style of equipment? And before I, before I ask that though, let me preface that by saying most homes in America, including my previous house, have something like this behind them. You know, a big gray box connected to some unit outside that's uh, either in a one or two story house, most of the time even two story houses just have one of these, with ductwork going everywhere from a basement or from a first floor, maybe even an attic. This is kind of a different paradigm. And let me ask you guys on the carrier side first, why make that transition from transitional, or pardon me, from traditional equipment to this kind of new technology? Well, I think a lot of that comes down to consumer expectations and what your comfort level is. You know, if you're used to a specific system and maybe your contractor's used to a specific system, then that's typically where your mind goes. But when you understand what this product can do for you, from an efficiency pers perspective, from you know simple things from walking outside and not hearing your outdoor unit operate, mm -hmm. to having high heat capacities, you know during the recent ice storm we had here in Texas, these things would not be pulling the crazy power like you have with that resistant heat and so forth. It's a great point. There are so many factors that come into play, and then you can customize these systems to how you're going to use the home. So you create custom uh, comfort zones essentially. Yeah architectural features you know you get those bonus rooms those flex spaces that we have all learned to value right now mm -hmm. those are all factors to consider and yes you have the units that look like what you're accustomed to having and those are a great piece of the puzzle but when you really look at all the pieces together it's amazing what you can have in an integrated system as my buddy christoph likes to say <laughs> i'm going to come back to that you mentioned zoning that's that's one that i want to spend a few minutes yeah. on specifically and how to zone and I'm gonna pull up some of uh, Positive Energy's plans on that. Yeah. But Dave, how would you answer that question? Why move, whether you're a builder watching this or someone who's gonna build a house, why move from a traditional upflow uh, unit to this new breed of equipment? Well, I think Justin touched on it, Matt. Uh, with, with a conventional system, we're trying to move air, and we're trying to move air throughout the home or the structure, and sometimes that can be challenging to do. Whereas with a ductless system, we still can use a traditional air handler like this, uh, ductless meaning without the need for duct work, but you can use it. With our systems, when we're, we're using ductless, we have different heads throughout the, the home. And so we talked about zoning. You can move refrigerant to those locations a lot easier than you can move air. Mm -hmm. And so we can put a high wall unit and a slim ducted unit and various units throughout the structure. Now we're able to provide precise comfort exactly where people want it and the temperature they want to have it. That's a great way to say it, Dad. I don't know that I ever thought about it that way. Uh, I've heard you, Christoph, talk about how heavy air is and how much energy it takes to move this heavy fluid throughout your whole house. Yeah. But that's an interesting point, Dave, thinking about, hey, I'm going to run two copper lines to that section of the house rather than moving two giant ducts with this fluid running through it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and just to touch on that, they are the same thing, right? You think about it, all the heat in your home when it's in cooling mode is leaving the home in that one refrigerant line. Mm -hmm. So the energy density, the heat density in that line is, is profound. And so why not do that within the home? Because we all know that air, you move air, you induce pressure differentials. When you do that, you get all kinds of durability issues and air quality issues. It's a system of systems. So avoiding moving large air masses is a good thing, generally. And architects are going to swoon, right? The palette of colors that they get in terms of the design, they can have thin profiles, they can have clear story windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, suddenly you, you can say yes when before you would have said no. It's a great point. And uh, just if I can go meta just for one minute. Please do. Another really great reason to go away from traditional practices is just to go away from traditional practices. The world <laughs> is changing. Um, I mean, to call a spade a spade, we're in a situation right now where some people moving into the HVAC industry, it's like the consolation career that they didn't really want, but they couldn't get a job coding or something. And, and I, paradoxically, coding might be the new blue collar kind of job. But we need to recognize and elevate that role in our society of the installing contractors. Agreed. And one way to do that is to say, look, this is sophisticated technology, and it is, is very important for our society that be, they be delivered by intelligent people. That's right. Great point, Christoph. 
Yeah. And Christoph, I'm gonna I'm gonna ping you again because you and I have been using these types of systems for about 12 years. In fact, I remember the first house. I don't know if you remember oh. this one, an architect's house, great architect in town, where he said, "I want to go VRF," meaning for him the outdoor unit had variable capacity. But we had a traditional uh, single upflow unit, which was really all we had in the budget on a two-story house. Um, do you remember that house? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, what about that project um, did we learn and did we, uh, or maybe this is me speaking from my experience, but mm. what, what are we doing differently from what we did 12 years ago? Well, I don't know if I'm remembering what you're remembering, but building science is a system of systems. We changed the design part of that system. And it needs to recognize that now we need to lean in on the installation side of that system. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, we, we obviated or we excluded a much of the benefit of going VRF by having one big central zone and trying to duct all around the house. Yeah. What is it you remember? You know, I, I would say that that was a two-story house that we were trying to heat and cool with a single uh, Oh, unit. yeah, yeah. Uh, and over the years, I've... I've I'll be honest, I've tried to heat and cool a lot of two-story houses over the years with single units, no matter where it was in the basement when I was working back north. Uh, in Texas, a lot of times it's two-story houses, slab on grade. Uh, there's a single unit downstairs that flows up to the attic or even uh, an attic mounted unit, which is ridiculous out of the conditioned space, pumping down into two stories below there's always a comfort complaint in those houses. Yep. And for a few years I tried, and this is at this point now, 15 years ago, I tried um, zone damper type systems. Oh, this zone damper will do this and sense this temperature. And I never had people's expectations met either from comfort or how they worked. On the other hand, the last 10 years or so, I've been using zoned, uh, generally ducted or ductless or a combination, which is really what I'm using both now. The comfort has gone way up and the expectations are being met. And funny enough, I remember an analogy you used years ago in a presentation, and I love your analogies, by the way, but one of your analogies was, can you imagine your clients who just walked into a meeting and they were in there, uh, you know, even the least cost car these days has dual zone heating and cooling control in the front seat. Do they really think that the husband or wife or, or partners in one side are getting a five degree or 10 degree temperature difference because someone said it's 68 and the other one said it's 78, but yet that's their expectation. And how does that translate to our houses? Mm. That expectation could almost never get met. Now, on the other hand, when we select systems like this and use some of this type of equipment, what could we do, Christoph? What are some of those options? Well, we can specify equipment that fits the architecture and fits the structure. I mean, that, that's what integrated design is. You have the architectural design, the structural design, and the mechanical design needs to fit it. Mm -hmm. um, and then expanding that, it's like, and the community needs to have the right parts and training and support that equipment. But the, the really important thing to remember is that this is not, um, the system of systems that delivers comfort is not these boxes around us. That's right, that's right. You know, like, I am not inside that box, I am inside this room, and it is this room that I need to be comfortable in. So that means the enclosure is really a very, very important piece. As we always say, the enclosure does the heavy lifting when it comes to thermal comfort. Yeah, and here in Texas, large expanses of glass with that are unshaded, it's not easy to deliver comfort in front of those. That's right. Not even possible. <laughs> I agree, I wanna add one thing to that too, and it's just because you know I see this all the time with people wanting to turn their system on and off, on and off. And with these type of systems, you wanna leave it on and let it run. They're so efficient, they pull such a small amount of power. And you gotta think about like, Christoph, I've heard you say it so many times, I know you've said some things on this video about the space, right? And that you've talked about the temperature of your skin, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you're standing on a slab right now, right? When you let that slab warm up and you walk into a space and you've had your house at 85 degrees during the day, and you're trying to bring that back and it's 100 degrees outside, that's not the best way to operate your system. <laughs> and it's not the best for your energy bill either. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's not best for comfort. No, so, you know, things to consider and, and learning and how to operate a cool system like this, uh, you know, most effectively. That's right. I mean, your body's thermal experience of a space is dominated by the surface temperatures around you. Now, this room is filled with, you know, 1,000 pounds of air. 
So if that wall, that's west happens to be, if that wall's getting hot from western exposure, the air that's adjacent to it is going to cool it off. It's going to actually going to absorb the heat and take it back through the return, get cooled, and get ready to do it again. So we actually, we use air conditioning to make the wall cool to make our client cool. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting balance. And we never talk about that, or at least in, in a broad scope, that's not talked about publicly. That's right. But it should be. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. I want to transition for a minute and talk specifically about a few of the pieces of equipment that you guys uh, talked about in the first video, because I think a lot of people are interested in knowing more about those different pieces and how they could use them. So first, uh, Justin, the traditional mini split head on the wall. Give us a little bit of a background about that. Is that normally a one-to-one -one system, meaning one head and one outdoor unit? Can you use that in other configurations? What do people yeah. need to know about that? What are the positives and what are the downsides? Absolutely. So, you know, traditionally it is used more as a one-to-one, -one, but it can be used as a multi-zone. And we also have these style of heads that can be applied to a VRF system as well, whether it be single phase or three phase. Now, uh, pause for a second <laughs> and define that for a second. I know that's, what, a, that's a huge, these could be used in VRF yeah. systems. What is good that? Luck with Variable that. refrigerant flow, which many splits and ductless, which are the same, ductless and many splits are the same, um, are all variable refrigerant flow technology. But there's differences in how they're powered. Like, okay. for example, VRF has a dual circuit. There's power to the outdoor, there's power to the indoor. And then there's a LEV, an expansion valve that you have in these systems. In ductless, it's in your outdoor unit. In VRF, it's in each head. And that is, those are two differences that allow for astronomical differences in the equipment as far as line set length, more head options, more indoor unit options. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, things like heat recovery that we'll talk about, simultaneous heat and cool. So basically they're very similar technologies, but those two differences amongst a few other things allow you to, you know, do different things, maybe stretch the equipment further in one application or pick a different type head. So, you know, like I said in the video, pick the right tool for the job, yeah. you know, learn about it, pick a contractor that's experienced. And, and, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Dave, let me ask you, well, yeah. I'll transition you then you can help hold that thought. Dave, tell us about these heads in terms of sizing. Like, what kind of capacity do these have? Do they just cool? Do they heat and cool? How big or small do they get? Sure, sure. Well, as a heat pump, of course, they're going to heat and cool, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what the need is. Now, with the ductless equipment, it's going to be either always in heating or always in cool cooling. That's how a heat pump works. We actually do have a single-phase VRF product that is uh, simultaneous heating and cooling, which is called heat recovery. Yep. Very cool technology. In fact, we were the first to come out with that in a single phase product but the capacity that you talked about quite a range in capacity not only in the outdoor units but the indoor units as well a 9,000 BTU head might have a, a low end capacity of 3,000 BTUs all the way up to 12,000 BTUs yep. and that matches up with the inverter compressor in the outdoor unit uh, Justin talked about how it runs uh, for longer run times well it's a variable speed compressor so it varies yep. and gives you the exact amount of heating or cooling for that particular zone that you need um, and it has that, that ability to adjust as it needs to. Yeah. And I think also just to add in, like, yeah, I think where you were going with that potentially too is, you know, how low do we go on the I side? I was just exactly, that's, you read my <laughs> mind. Oh, I've known you for a while, my yeah. friend. Yeah. So these, and this model right here, which is our new performance cassette, those are going to be available in 6,000 BTUs here shortly. This that we have right here is a 9,000 BTU. On the VRF side, on the single phase VRF side, we do go all the way down to 5,000 BTUs. Dang. On Small that units. Yeah. The, the thing yeah. to point out about that, though, is that 5,000 or 6,000 BTUs doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to be running at that's that 6,000 BTUs. Exactly. That's right. Sorry. So, what is the smaller size? Uh, 6,000 BTU might ramp down to what? 3,000 or lo even lower less than, than that? that? Less than yeah, that. Less than yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly the point. So in May in Austin, when it's not 100 out, it's only 90, a 6,000 BTU unit could easily run at half that capacity or oh, yeah. less. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've heard you talk a lot about that, Christoph. Um, and let's transition just for a minute. This is basics. But help us to understand when you're doing the manual J, uh, when your company's doing that manual J for, for me on my projects, help us to understand that design temperature and how that translates to equipment selection and how this ductless, uh, ducted VRF uh, helps you as an equipment designer find something that works for my houses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, manual J is a, is a very important process to get right. And uh, it's been interesting thinking about the system of systems again, where uh, 
we ask people, what are your window specs? What are your enclosure specs? And we hear feedback like, oh, I've never been asked for that before. Um, so, so just manual J, get it right, take it slow and careful. It's heating, cooling, and dehumidification in my climate load calculations. Mm -hmm. But then all these capacities we just talked about, so 6,000 BTUs an hour is a half a ton. That is at AHRI rating conditions, right? So that's 90, wait, uh, eight, what is it? Someone saying 95 I'm and 17. Out. Yeah, right. So it's, it's not when it's 100 out or 90 yeah, out. It's right. 95, right? Right. There you yeah. go. So I got it. And it's 80 inside. So if you keep your house at 72 and it's 100 out, that half ton system isn't going to give you a half a ton, mm -hmm. right? right? For, conversely, if you were keeping it at, at 80 and it was lower than 95 out, it would be uh, more than a half a ton, right? So and if I could just jump in on that, one of the things that we often uh, educate people to do is to take a look at the product data, because right in the product data we publish exactly what the outdoor t different outdoor temperatures can be and what that capacity range is that you alluded to of what that machine will actually do. So when it comes, yeah. So when it comes to sizing, know what your load calculation is, know what the outdoor and ambient temperatures are, and then what you want the indoor to be, and then you can look at what the total capacity of that unit will be under those conditions and you can size it precisely for that application. That's exactly right, yeah. And, and I think to answer your question, Matt, you, you do the load calculation, you define the thermal zones inside the building, and then you pick the equipment that matches it most closely. And there's, that could go on forever, that little conversation. Man, That's I love an important it. conversation, though. <laughs> you know, you mentioned something that, that uh, makes me want to uh, pull up my iPad for a second. Um, this on my iPad here is the positive energy plans for my house. And Christoph, I know it's been a while since you've probably looked at this, but explain to me what these colors mean on the first floor of my house on these so plans. Those are the thermal zones. The purple is your central core, kind of downstairs. Kitchen's in pink. And your garage, which definitely cannot be considered a, a zone that you could mix with an airside zoning system, mm -hmm. is in blue. Mm -hmm. And so why would I, uh, number one, why would I want to put my garage on its own zone? Why couldn't I just share that zone with another <laughs> part of the house? Well, because we still have uh, internal combustion engines for the most part across this country, and that is not a set of gases that you want to have inside your house. And so when you park in your, your car in the garage, cools off, all those gases leave, they're in the garage. I mean, we have seen houses during construction where the air control layer includes the garage <laughs> and not separating it from the, the house. So that, that's one very basic reason. Yeah, we want to keep that And, and the comfort profile and expectation in the garage is going to be different than the rest of the house. And so garages, gosh, this feels basic for me, but it's worth noting just because not everyone knows this. Garage is a great place to use a one-to-one -one, uh, mini split head like this one that J uh, Justin just talked about a minute ago. Uh, and that's what I've got at my house. That's what I'm putting in the next house. That's an all-carrier house that you're going to see some videos on. Um, with, with caveat being, turn it off if you're using the chop saw in there. That's or right. Sanding that's something. Right. That's or, right. If yeah. it's a workshop, it's not the right choice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I'm just trying to keep my uh, pantry, which tends to be in my garage because I have a very large family and small <laughs> house, uh, below 80 degrees. So I'm going to set that thing at 80 degrees in the summer, uh, and I'll set it at uh, 60 in the winter. Uh, and so it's going to hardly have to run because I also insulated the heck out of my garage. And I'm also doing a fully insulated garage door and I'm air sealing my garage. Wow. Yeah. So I'm hearing prepper. Is that right? I'm a bit of a prepper, yes. <laughs> that's true. Just to jump in on it, the operating cost for that condition is really, really low. It's pennies on the dollar. So mm -hmm. conditioning a space where people aren't living, you might think, hmm, I'm not sure about that. Well, it doesn't cost much to do. And then because of the load and how it affects the rest of the home, it's a perfect thing to do. It also means my garage freezer that's just a basic garage freezer, not a special one, won't die like my previous one did because it was in a hot garage right. and it wasn't rated for garage use. Yeah. So the manufacturer didn't make good in the warranty on it. Yeah. Another similar concept to that would be a sunroom or those rooms that get placed above a garage that maybe are going to be finished out later. That's right. Any separate space like that really should be call. treated separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now next up on my house, this pink zone in my house, when you come in through the garage at this uh, door right there. You walk into a laundry uh, kind of uh, kitchen pantry space and then there's a pocket door into my kitchen. And Christoph, that is a pink zone on the plans here with just this one little unit over here. What is that? Can you explain what's going on there? Well, that's primarily cooling the kitchen, which is primarily where you're going to be. And then we've shared some air between that and the adjacent room. Exactly right. There's an air share fan 
that's going here. And also my Zender fresh air unit is gonna be moving some air through there. And I would but, just like to submit that not always do you have to use the, the air sharing type of device, depending on how the structure is designed, if the doors are left open, the continuous fan on that indoor unit will really help mix the air and, and have the temperatures be somewhat even, even if you do have one unit serving multiple rooms. Yeah, that's, right. That's, right. Right. Yeah. that's right. Yeah, that's right. And there's a really important, you need to talk to the owners, owner intake, including owner feedback in the process if you can have it, and you know, if it's not a spec home. But you know, we explained to you that the, the comfort profile is going to be different in the core of the kitchen versus in that entry room. That's right. Sure can. And I'm, a, I'm fine with my laundry being a little hotter, <laughs> uh, and that's totally okay, especially because I was a part of that decision. Uh, Carrier makes uh, a unit that would work perfect there, and I want to explain this picture just a little bit because uh, this was when I first saw it, I wasn't sure what was going on. <laughs> See those two ducts on this picture above? Those ducts are actually not a part of the unit. That's, let's say, ductwork from another machine. And see the all thread coming down? That all thread is connected to this uh, unit. And Justin, explain to us what this unit is and how this works. So this is a linear or one-way cassette. So, you know, we looked at this wall mount straight behind me, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a similar concept, but it sits flush in the ceiling. So okay. you've got that directional airflow, you've got your return through the bottom, you're going to have a close to seamless look with the ceiling, and you're going to get pretty substantial throws out of this. And if you look at the depth of that unit, again, where you see where that paperwork is at the top, yep. right? Yep. That's, that's where, the top of the that's unit. That's the right? top of the unit. It's tiny. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that looks absolutely. like it's, what, eight inches deep or ten inches yeah. deep maybe max? Yeah, absolutely. And so. by pulling that, that ceiling grill, it almost kind of looks like a, you know, a fart fan grill in some respects. It's a plastic grill. Pulling that down is going to give you access for maintenance, for pulling filters, yeah. doing everything from below. That's basically what's in my kitchen or will be in my kitchen. It's not installed yet. I'm going to talk uh, to Carrie about renaming that grill name, too. <laughs> the fart fan grill? Yeah. I, don't think, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it'll get approved. My guess is corporate's not going to like that, <laughs> no, but no. it helps the builders understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, let's transition to ducted um, VRF or ducted, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Justin? Help me with the yeah, terminology. So, this so this you, unit behind me and that unit on the ceiling. Yeah, absolutely. So you do have ducted systems within the ductless or the mini split line, mm -hmm. and you also have them in the VRF line. Yep. So what you have directly behind that is our pancake style unit, our fur down style unit. People call it by different names. Slim, pancake style, slim. that's this guy right back here. Absolutely, yeah. It's and, on my iPad now as well. There you go. So one thing that's cool about this unit, um, is this has a dual position offering. So this is a multi-position unit. It can be horizontal as you're used to seeing these if you're familiar with this equipment, yep. or it can be turned vertically as we saw in the video, which that allows for some really cool things architecturally. Yep. And we have a picture to show, or maybe a couple of pictures to illustrate this and what it can mean to your build. I got it right here, brother. Um, so explain to me, I'll throw it up on the screen, what we're seeing here, Justin. Absolutely, so this is at a house in Austin and um, We've got this pancake style air handler underneath the stairwell. You've got your return there at the bottom. So this is an upflow unit. It's an up space. upflow unit. You've got your plenum going up through the space. And then this goes into a small space between the floors that ducks out into a large vaulted space. And this conditioned a large area here where you had you know, high vaulted ceilings. It also went over and conditioned the kitchen. But you get a cool streamless look with those linear cassettes and you had a difficult scenario to condition here, you also end up with additional space underneath the stairwell too. So there's a lot of things that can be done with this. And I ask myself, you know, as a builder and as a homeowner, what kind of value does the mechanical system add? Mm -hmm. The mechanical system itself, comfort it adds, you know, efficiency it adds, but when you can do things architecturally like this, that's the icing that people talk about. So mm -hmm. you can do things mm -hmm. with these systems that you can't readily do with traditional air conditioning. Yeah, that's I love when, it, I, when I talked about it, it opens beautiful. up the, the palette of colors to the design. That's what I'm really talking about. You just basically need a thick wall mm -hmm. now to put your air handler in. And we've done these uh, in built-in cabinets in the middle of a space, yep. so a large open space. All you need is refrigerant line, condensate line, and power, and suddenly you got cooling. We've put them behind TVs, so you tilt the TV out of the way. Oh, am I live on your iPad? No, I'm, I'm about to take a picture, though. <laughs> you tilt the TV out of the way, and uh, there's your air handler right behind, or a piece of artwork. I mean, it's tremendous. Yep, I've got a story about that just real quick. Just to, to tell you how out, of side, how, how out of sight and out of mind this can be. So a contractor buddy of mine, I'm visiting him on his new ranch, 
and uh, he's got this beautiful home that he's renovating, but they wanted this modern open concept, right? So they bring in this structural steel, they open everything up, and he's talking to me, and he's saying, man, how do I air condition this space? <laughs> and this is an HVAC contractor. He's an HVAC contractor, but he's a buddy and he does more traditional <laughs> HVAC. Actually, he's a good contractor too, but that just tells you how out of sight, out of mind this can be. Yeah. And I told him, hey, you know this product can go vertical and we could place this in the wall here and fur it out slightly, have part of your media center that tilters out and then it can be back behind there with a linear cassette, your return to the bottom. And he was like, man, that fixes my problem. I love it. So. I love it. And Matt, I just want to point out, you know, earlier we were talking about the, the high wall units and the size of them and, and maybe small, if you maybe have a small bedroom that's eight by 10 foot or eight by eight foot, you know, that slim ducted unit can be a great solution for that application as well because you can run ductwork just to those small yeah. rooms. And I actually have a, uh, a, um, a case that I want to show you at my house where I did that. So. Uh, this picture that I took on my iPad two seconds ago, there's Christoph <laughs> smiling. Uh, this is what Christoph uh, always in the years past referred to as pizza box style units <laughs> because it looks like three or four pizza boxes stacked up. And I, I love that analogy because it kind of tells you the size. It's a very small unit, but it looks like traditional ductwork either to you your, or your clients, which is nice because it doesn't feel like a mini split head if you don't like them. So um, what's cool about Carrier, which I didn't know until today, is that they make those uh, units uh, in, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my iPad and talking anyway. at the same time. They make those units in either horizontal flow, like the picture I just showed you, or vertical flow. I use them at my house under construction in this purple zone. Now this purple zone at my house is my main uh, living space. When you walk in this front door right here, uh, you're in a foyer, uh, and then you come into my dining room, my living room, and this whole suite right here is my master bedroom. And you'll notice there's two boxes in the plans here from Positive. There's this box, and there's this box. The box on the right, this one right here that I just X'd, that is a pizza box unit. And it's doing a very large space because my envelope is so good. Uh, I've got good insulation, I've got thick insulation, and I've got very little airflow through my envelope. I actually don't remember the sizing off the top of my head, but I think this is around uh, uh, 18,000 BTU yeah, exactly. system, a you know, ton and a half, let's say. And that's doing that load 99, 98% of the time. The 1% of the time, when I need some extra oomph, I need some extra cooling in July because it's super ridiculous hot out, or I've invited 30 of my kids' friends over for a party, I've got this unit right here, which is a, a, a fantastic unit that I call a party zone. <laughs> Justin, give us your thoughts on the party zone and how does that help my house uh, from a comfort and an efficiency standpoint. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, the party zone unit is a very fitting name and that, I think that's how originally people started utilizing it is, you know, we're gonna have a bunch of people over here and we wanna be able to have the capacity and not be drastically overcooling the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. So let's throw a unit on here. What a concept to have that where we're not oversized the rest of the time, but then we have this unit that we can entertain with. But what I find is when people have this on their house, they realize that wait a minute, I can run that unit in the center of the house. We're not occupying the bedrooms right now. And it's much more efficient than that central system. That's right. So I can save a ton of money on my electric bill. Yep. Not only that, but that coil being smaller and working harder, essentially keeping that coil cold, you're pulling a lot more moisture out of the space. There are so many factors that come into place. And then if you get into a situation where you can control the architecture, let's mm -hmm. say it's a build or a remodel, and you have California sliding glass doors where you're going to have an open concept. If you have a unit that is sized appropriately for when that is open to help temper that oh, air. It's way too big. Yeah, yeah. So that will allow you to do some things that are, you know, pretty extreme. Yeah. But don't expect it to hold, you know, 72 degrees. With the doors open. Yeah, the doors oh, open. The <laughs> but we get, we get people doing things to where they'll do like an exterior envelope and they'll shut some doors. Uh -huh. And then they'll have a unit like that there to where they have a pool outside and they want to keep it, they don't want it 90 degrees in their space, but they can maybe keep it 78 in there, 80 degrees, and keep it comfortable, have a cool zone for people to walk in. Yeah, for a short period of time. For a short period of time, not for long periods of time. Yeah. Two reasons why I did it. Uh, number one, I wanted the, the additional load, because we do have parties, we have a lot of people over. Yeah. Uh, number two, 
Uh, I like the economy of this because now I've got a right size unit that Positive Energy designed for my main space, and it's that it's that uh, pizza box unit. Uh, it's a ducted um, uh, mini split, for lack of a better term. But I also put that head on the wall. Oh, I'm sorry, let me finish my thought. And it's also an economical way to do it. Those heads are not very darned expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's tied to the same outdoor unit compressor, which uh, positive energy size for me. So it's a pretty economical way to get a party zone rather than a, a whole nother one of these upflow furnaces and a whole nother whatever system. And I've done that too. But this is a, a pretty, for, I hate to say it this way, but it's a cheap way to get a party zone. I also put that mini split on the head, head on the wall because I want people coming over to my house to ask me about it. Uh, and I want that mini split head to be seen as normal. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of uh, what's, what's the uh, nice way to say PO'd? I hate it when people are like, oh, I don't want to see that head on the wall. That looks so ugly. Really? Is that really that bothersome to you? You know, I remember going to Japan. Uh, they all have only been there once, but I went like 16 years ago. And I'd never seen a mini split head anywhere. And all of a sudden I go to Japan and every single house, every room had one. And I'm, I slept in a bedroom in a Japanese house that had a controller for my bedroom. That at the time I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to set my thermostat to 67 degrees at night. And I could do whatever I want regardless of what the rest of the house did. I thought it was genius. And you go upstairs to the living room. There's another one on the wall. Great. You can set your living room to whatever you want. In Europe, in Asia, in pretty much everywhere but America, it's totally normal to see these in the wall and no one objects to them. So I, I'm on a mission to get people to go, that's totally normal, that's great, I'm fine with that. And, and just let it go away from your mind as something that, that it isn't even seen anymore. I just want to jump in on that. You're absolutely right. One thing that doesn't look, look normal that some people try to do is to put that high wall unit as close to the ceiling as they can possibly get it. <laughs> you can get ours within about three inches of the ceiling, but it looks kind of silly up there. I mean, you don't put a clock that close to the ceiling or a painting that close to the ceiling. So bring it down, make it look nice, and right. it fits in perfectly. Totally. Yeah, and I got one more chime in too. So the psychology of thermal comfort is quite fascinating. Like in our vehicles, we're fine with a blue to red knob, activating it in real time. I entered this, you know. But our homes, we want every square inch to be at the same temperature all the time. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, that doesn't really work, but I, I'm also not optimistic that we're about to revolutionize North American comfort psychology. I mean, we're changing the way we build houses one, uh, one house at a time, and that's why people who are watching this are like-minded to us mm -hmm. uh, and are doing this. Uh, you know, I saw several of you uh, that were registered for this or friends of mine that I know are building and designing great houses. So we've got a like-minded audience here. That's good. And my guess is all over the nation, uh, we're building better, we're designing better, we're actually doing manual J's. Uh, and so my guess is we're preaching to the choir on this. Yeah, yeah. I got one thing I want to say there too, you know, we, not too long ago, nobody had a TV on the wall, right? <laughs> That's right. And now it's like the bigger the TV on your wall, the better. Yeah. So maybe in the comments, if we need to make these wall mounts bigger, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Guys, we've got 12 minutes left. I have one last point, and then I'm going to switch to Q&A, because honestly, I saw it. Uh, we're like at 50 or 60 Q&As. We're never going to get to them all. Yeah. But last thing I wanted to mention on zoning uh, on my iPad here. Christoph, uh, we've got three zones on the first floor, and we kind of talked about how we used um, this type of equipment to do that. But if you look at my upper zone of my house, it's one big purple zone, meaning it's uh, one temperature, one zone in the house. It's separate from my basement zone, so I, I can separately zone that. And this is also a pizza box uh, style unit uh, for my upstairs. Christoph, talk to me quickly about two-story houses and zoning and your thoughts on that. Well, uh, warmer air is naturally buoyant and it's going to go upstairs. Colder air is naturally le le more dense and it's going to flow downstairs. There has been great hope that if you increase the enclosure performance that it's not going to matter. Where you introduce the air, it's all going to be kind of achieving the same temperature throughout. But even on passive houses, we've found that um, having systems separated by upstairs and downstairs is uh, very important. As is, you know, eastern, western exposure, things like that, day use, night use. Um, with that being said, guys, let's transfer to Q&A. We're going to try and get to the, as many of these as we can. And by the way, we've got some carrier people behind the scenes answering if you're on the live. So some of these may get answered behind the scenes for you. Um, but let's start with uh, Patrick Harrington, who says, 
Give me an example of a backup system for homes. I'm submitting this question early, uh, and it may be answered, but give me an example of a backup system for a home. So I think there's two different ways to talk about that. I don't think you want to go in and have twice the capacity in your house that you would normally need. That's an expense that I, I don't think really makes sense, right? But, you know, like your home that we've been working with you on, how you've chosen to go with multiple outdoor units, mm -hmm. one-to-ones. I think that's what you said, or that's my answer to this too, I think. Absolutely. So we're on the same page on this. That's a much better way to go because if you have a system go down, it's probably not going to be all your systems, right? Yep. And then that way you can still keep a relative cool temperature in your space and you definitely have a space, especially if you have a certain thermal zone that's closed off, where you can still keep that very comfortable while your system's being repaired. And then that comes into doing things like putting a surge protector on there, making sure you have clean power and so forth. Those are things that will help prevent some failures and picking the right contractor, a contractor with experience. I love the redundancy. Uh, we got a video coming up on this, uh, but basically the house that I've got under construction that Justin mentioned has this system and this system and about a 2,200 square foot house. Yeah. Most of the house is getting heated and cooled with this unit here, which is ducted and looks normal uh, to the house. And then there's an outdoor unit right there that's a two ton. And then one part of the house, which is kind of a home office, guest bedroom, future uh, caretaker suite, has a one-to-one, -one, which is this one right here. Uh, and so now we've got two compressors. If something happened in 10 or 20 years and one goes out, we've got a room of the house that can be heated and cooled separately. I love that. Absolutely. Now, Justin, um, I can't remember who asked the question, but I've, I've, I want to answer this one for sure. Someone said, what do we need to know about mini split heads in terms of maintenance? Yes. Uh, reliability, um, what do I need to do in the future to make sure that thing's working efficiently? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know, I think this is one that Dave and I should work on together. You know, there are some excellent features in this unit, and we've taken feedback over the last six, seven years in developing this unit from contractors, from homeowners, you know, from comments that consumers are placing in. Expectations as far as install, maintenance, and maintenance is a big deal, you know? How do you maintain a typical unit? So you've got your filter on top. <laughs> You're gonna wanna check your filter at least monthly, and I would recommend you go ahead and clean it. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of ways you can do that. You can wash it off. And that's not a heavy duty filter, that's a dust filter for like. Yeah, of it's it's not one of those that I would say. <laughs> it's not a MERV filter. It's not a HEPA there. filter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not a HEPA filter. So, but that's a great opportunity to do something like an in-room air purifier, which Carrier just released their new in-room air purifier. And that's a great option to do something like that. Because yeah, uh, ultimately the filtration on these units is not great. Yeah, the OptiClean. Yeah. That's the con, unit. I would say. Yeah, the, the OptiClean opti unit. Opti OptiClean would be another one. But from a maintenance perspective, of course, you want to clean your filter. The other thing that happens with these units, and those of you that have experience with them, especially contractors, homeowners that have had them for years, eventually you're going to end up with a dirty blower wheel in here. And, and let me pause you for a second. Yeah. When you have in the past, uh, for we've put a lot of mini splits in oh, our houses, yeah. when you have a dirty blower wheel or you have a dirty unit with a coil, what's it like uh, to get that thing clean? Oh, it's brain damage. <laughs> and it, it, those are the, so condensate management on these wall heads and blower wheels that get caked up with dust and are just slapping the air and therefore not moving it through the space. Big problem. And now that all changes with the redesign in the carrier system. This system right here, we have uh, just a, a couple hasps in there and one screw and the whole blower assembly drops down. So it makes cleaning them extremely easy. You can basically pull that whole blower assembly down in, in just a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so we've, as Justin was saying, we've taken a lot of feedback and because they do need, you do need to clean the systems, we've made it very easy to do now because we don't want to be doing brain surgery in the field for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a video queued up uh, that's about two minutes long on how to clean one of these units, in particular this brand new unit from Carrier. So let's take uh, two minutes and pop over to that. Absolutely. Hi, this is just a quick video on how to and disassemble the new carrier mid-tier high wall unit. So the first thing we want to do is hold it at each end, and then this prop rod, you position it all the way back to the hold it up. And then you'll see you have two locking clasps right here and right here. All we want to do is take those loose, and there's just one screw holding this whole piece together. So with a Phillips head screwdriver, you want to take that loose. And then right here and right here, you'll see that there's handles that tell you to pull up. 
When you pull up, this whole bottom piece comes out. And then you'll see two more clasps. Right here and right here. Take those loose. Before you do anything else, you need to take your electrical panel and prop that up. You've got a little prop rod right here. Because your blower motor harness right here and your louver motor harness right here need to be disconnected in order for you to pull the blower out. And then your drain's got to come loose. So if you push this clasp backwards and then pull down on this, And get that out of your way. Now this is ready to come out. My suggestion is to pull up so that each one of these clears where these are being clicked on and then very carefully with your hands on ends of this unit pull it out and then pull it back. Now you have access to your blower wheel and your blower motor. And all you have to do is take a long skinny Phillips head screwdriver and unscrew it off of the shaft and then that's going to slide out and then that's going to pop out. All right guys, we are coming to the top of the hour, but I've gotten the approval from my boss to go a little long. <laughs> so we might go a couple of extra 10 minutes or so. There's a ton, a ton of good questions. I think we're already to 100 or so questions. So we may go a few minutes long if you guys can spare the time. Sure. Christoph, question from Alan Smith. In areas that don't have residential VRF or ductless familiarity with contractors, how do you recommend adopting this technology in that area? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So first step, ask for it. Second step, encourage contractors to get training for it. Um, the, the manufacturers often can provide significant support, maybe even on the job site. I'm not going to commit you to that. Companies but, like mine provide job site support as well. Absolutely. But we absolutely can doubt. You know, a carrier has the largest distribution network throughout North America. And so the local expertise is, is available to contractors. Just see your local carrier distributor. They've got the training uh, available and certainly the support staff. And I, I want to add, this is a very real question for us. Right? Yeah. You know, because Christoph, Matt, you know, we've known each other throughout that process where you're going through and you're trying to find the right contractor, right? Yeah. And like Christoph said, you have to ask for it. You have to have the consumer demand. You end up working with the manufacturer to find, you know, the contractors that have attended their training. Mm -hmm. Who would yeah. they recommend? Yeah, that's a great way to do it is go to the carrier website and you guys have a contractor locator feature, right? Yep, we absolutely. do. And you can also look at your local distributor and reach out to a local distributor and contact them. Right. That's a yep. great way to do it too, guys. In fact, I want to mention that comment specifically, Justin, that referral to someone who's doing it already, I think is great. And if, funny enough, you said that Alan later, I didn't finish his question, but later he says, uh, Matt has mentioned not wanting to be the guinea pig. Do manufacturers <laughs> have commissioning assistance for these types of areas to ensure proper installation. I would agree with that. If you're uh, if your HVAC contractor who's bidding your work or working on your project has never installed one of these before, I don't want to be the first one that's, that's uh, getting installed. You want someone who's done it before. And this technology is not uh, new. These products, a few of them may be new products, but it's in a family, it's in a type of commissioning that has been in the marketplace for a long time. So in Austin, for instance, where we are, there's, I, could, I could name a half dozen good contractors Absolutely. that are familiar with your equipment, that do good duct work, that do good installs, that are commissioning it well. Uh, outside of that area, find that local dealer, walk in the door. At Robert Matten, you saw the, the front door a minute ago. Uh, it's a contractor specific place, but if you walked in as a homeowner, as a builder, as a remodeler, as an architect, and said, Absolutely. hey, I'm looking for a great HVAC company, who's the, who are the top three in your mind that install your ductless equipment, yep. I guarantee you they would have probably a name off top of their head that's, yeah. oh, this guy's great. And Car be specific also. I was just going to say, Carrier has factory authorized dealers, and our factory authorized dealers are highly trained, they're the cream of the crop, and they are very well trained on our ductless equipment. Yeah, and also you want to be specific and mention that you're looking for someone that is focused and experienced in ductless and VRF because there might be a great contractor that's specialized on central systems and they never dip their toe in the water with mini splits or VRF, but totally agree with you on that. That's a great place to go. That's a great one. Let's talk about gas appliances for a second. I'm seeing a bunch of questions mm -hmm. 
uh, about gas heating? Do I want to dual fuel? Uh, do I want to uh, do those other kinds of things along with this system? I actually want both of you guys to answer from the carrier perspective and from the Kristoff perspective. <laughs> uh, and I want you to go meta for a minute. Uh, first off, <laughs> what, is, what, is, uh, what does carrier say about dual fuel options for that, that sort of thing? You want to take a minute first, Dave? Um, absolutely. We're, we're, carrier's objective is to provide comfort uh, to the world. And uh, we provide it in any fashion that makes the most sense. So dual fuel hybrid combinations are absolutely embraced by us and, and available. You can have ductless outdoor units matched up to, to gas furnace indoor units. It just depends on what is best for that particular application. You can mix and match uh, really any way you want. Uh, one of the cool things about our equipment is when you do that is we use a 24 volt interface to help the different systems communicate but we retain the full variable speed nature of that inverter compressor. Nobody else can do that when you match up hybrid systems like that. So it's a really cool way to go. Love it. Yeah. Christoph, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Justin. You want to jump in too? You're cool. I just wanted to add one more thing if you're all right with that. Please, do it. <laughs> all right. So I just wanted to say, you know, he made the this, this statement, it depends. And it very much depends. When you're looking at Central Texas, there's really not that great of a reason to, to go to gas unless you've just got a super cheap, gas, but we don't have a huge heating season here. I've unplugged my house from the gas line. And then you don't have to work, wor worry about ventilation, air, gas leaks, all those factors go out of the issue, out, you know, CO2, all those things that can come into the be issues, right? But with the system like this, you can go in and you can do effective heating and cooling. If you're further north, let's say you're in Canada or you're in an area where you would benefit from having gas part of the time. Mm -hmm. You can do that and you can set your threshold with these systems to where it works as a heat pump until it's kind of like, it's really more efficient to operate as gas now. So you can do that. It's a great point. Yeah. It's a great point. On, on the economic side of going uh, all heat pump and eliminating gas, uh, ask your plumber to break out his bid on your houses and eliminate the gas connections. That black iron pipe that runs through your attic, that runs through your house, it's not inexpensive, it's very labor intensive. The pipe itself is cheap, but they're threading that in the driveway, they're putting it together. It usually takes the plumber one to two days with one to two guys to run all the gas piping for a house. So eliminating that can be a savings that you could put to other things in the house. Yeah, absolutely right. But Christoph, from a, from a bigger perspective, what do you think about natural gas appliances and this VRF technology? <laughs> all right, two quick comments on that. One is, when natural gas burns, it oxidizes at around 3,500 degrees, so 3,000 degrees. So just think about it. You're using a 3,000 degree, degree heat source to heat your water to 120, <laughs> 130, or your air to 70. I don't have to say much more to show you. That's silly. But think about the global economy right now. It is essentially run on combustion, on like, like, like our, we call them thermal generation plants on our electric grid. So we're burning things. We're, when we're using a fuel to create heat, there's no way around it. We are, we are destroying something, and it yeah. doesn't come back. But two minutes of the sun's energy can power the global economy for a day, right? <laughs> wow. Might even be for a year, but you know, it's exactly. So future, our kids, our kids' kids are gonna be like, when my dad was a kid, they burned things to create power <laughs> and to, to heat their houses, right? So it's, uh, there's a whole other topic I could dive into and why I took the uh, fireplace out of my house, too, and put it in the outside so yeah, I could perfect. make four fires a year outside for ambiance uh, and not have an air leak in my house all year long yeah. from that flu and that furnace not and that big air quality. bridge and the air quality. Mm -hmm. That's right. And those of you that don't know Christoph, he's literally a rocket scientist. So Literally a rocket yeah, scientist. Every, every time I walk away from talking with him, I feel more intelligent. Me so too. I man. appreciate I love, your I love hanging out with you. Opinion. By osmosis, I get smarter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Jens. All right, I got, a, I got a hard question for you guys, and I've talked about this on videos before. Uh, let's see, I lost the question. The question is basically, uh, oh, here it is. Chuck McVicker said, do VRF units do a better job of dehumidification because of the longer run times? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's... I'm going to let you both answer it. Go ahead. You started it, <laughs> you buddy. Go first, yeah. The dehumidification is going to be proportional to the, the, the temperature of the coil and the air that's incident on temperature that's below dew point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, mean, I could leave it at that. I could leave it at that. And I, I, I worked at a wind tunnel lab for a number of years, so 
I'm literally a PE in mechanical engineering. I just well, want to get back to that. From a I'm going to stop right there. No, no, Go no. Ahead, Justin, you want to say it too, and I'll give the uh, my experience perspective. Absolutely. And, and I also want to hear from both of you after the end, and, and tell me if we're off on this. But from what I see is that you want your mechanical system to bear the brunt of your humidity removal from here, the space. Here. So that is not the only solution, especially when you get into an extremely tight envelope. Mm -hmm. So you want to size it correctly. And yes, a VRF and a ductless system, in my opinion, does very much effectively remove moisture when it's sized properly. But during swing seasons are seasons where you have situations to where you've got a lot of moisture that's introduced to the space, especially if you have a tight envelope, you need to look at a separate standalone dehumidification system. And then also you wanna look at control algorithms. For example, if you've got a system like this on your central system where you have a relative humidity sensor and you can control to help pull more of the moisture out with your central system, that's a great option, but it's not an all-in-one solution. Here, here. Yeah. Dehumidifiers are supplemental dehumidifiers, but his question was, does, it, does the increased runtime of VRF dehumidify better than conventional equipment? Yeah, that's true. There's only a certain amount of heat that needs to get removed from that room, so whether you remove it fast or slow, frankly, if you remove it fast, it's a very cold coil for a very short time, probably had more condensate generated. Mm. Sorry to say. Yeah. I mean, the point but, is, you gotta get supplemental. But VRF, you know, if you wanted to say now for the same amount of energy, I could make it colder with VRF and get more water out. Now, just depends yeah. on how you put that experiment yeah. together. I think to comparison. Justin's point, they're not, they're not designed to be the primary, you know, the, the sole source of right. humidification. Sometimes I agree. you might have to have supplemental. And one other thing on that that I think is really important is it depends on how you operate your system. So if you were to take one head and have that system that's a small coil, a small indoor unit, and have that running to help pull moisture out, that's going to very effectively I would agree with that. pull moisture. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors to look at and understand in this. I would agree with that. We've got one, time for one more question, but before we jump on that last question, I do want to make mention that anyone who's watching this webinar live, next week you're going to get an email with an ebook that my team put together in conjunction with Carrier. Uh, kind of giving you more details on what we talked about. So hopefully some of the questions that didn't get answered will be in that ebook. And if you're watching this uh, on a pre-recorded, there's probably a link in whatever's below me now <laughs> that you can click on Absolutely. to get a hold of that ebook. But this last question is a great one. We haven't gotten into noise level uh, very much, although you mentioned the outdoor units are very quiet. Very quiet. Matthew Gilmore says, comfort has to do with the temperature of the space, but also the noise in here, the space. Here. Uh, uh, Christoph's clapping over here. What are the decibel levels on these units, and how much does it change when operating at minimum capacity versus maximum capacity? Christoph, I'm going to let you take that one. I'll you, start with the beginning. Were, uh, these guys will know the specs better, but well, when you showed a picture of this guy behind me, this is something that you can only pull off if you have a very quiet air handler, mm -hmm. right? This short, this short length of duct work on both sides of it. But as far as the sound pressures, uh, the VRF air handlers, there is a variation depending on which head you're using. It does depend on which head you're using, but it can be below 25 dBA. It wow. can be extremely, which is extremely quiet. quiet. Tremendously quiet. Outdoor units, uh, 55 dBA or, or lower. We're, we're using them in a lot of uh, jurisdictions where sound ordinances are influencing the yeah. choice of outdoor units now. So yeah, they're whisper quiet. They're so, very, very quiet. There's a range <laughs> to answer that question, but they're all very quiet. I think putting it in real terms might make it you know, please more do. effective for most people on the line. And please get online and check out our specs so you can see the specific decibel ratings per product. But if you're outside by one of these condensing units, I've done it at my own house. I replaced the house that I sold a while back with 100% ductless in that house. And before when I walked outside in summer, when it's hot outside, even at night, you don't hear, yeah, you just, all you hear is that condensing unit. What you hear is your neighbor's condensing unit. That's, <laughs> that's where I was going. An acre away, I could hear my neighbor's condensing unit. Wow, that's so, a Texas boy right there. An yeah. acre away, his neighbor's unit. That tells you something right there. <laughs> I love it. And you can go out there, you can have a conversation by your outdoor unit, which is much more noisy than your indoor unit. Yeah. And you hardly know it's running. When you're indoor, you usually aren't going to know that thing's running unless you're really up there trying to hear it mm -hmm. with your ear next to it. You're probably not going to notice that it's running. But I will say things like condensate pumps, accessories that people buy. If you get a condensate pump, that pump that's noisy or you have a contractor that recommends one that's noisy, 
that's usually where we get the complaints. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a great point that you need a great design. And a quick plug for these guys, <laughs> uh, you know, when you design these systems, if you can gravity drain, you're always going to be yes. better off Agreed. than putting a pump in. And be willing to be flexible on the job. In fact, this happened to me last week with that unit right there where I placed it uh, myself in a spot that my HVAC guy said, now where are we going to drain that? You know, we're probably going to have to put a pump in and move it over here. And I thought, oh, ding, 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 dummy, don't put it there. Move it to the other wall, which makes much more sense because I can gravity drain it into a sink area in the adjacent uh, powder bath, basically. So I saved my client the noise of the pump, the price of the pump, and the maintenance of the pump, all because I was willing to move that unit. Agreed. And uh, gravity is reliable. And gravity always <laughs> seems to work. I've not floated <laughs> off my seat any time uh, during this hour and a half. Love it. Guys, really, really good uh, webinar. We probably could have gone for three hours. I should have you all on my new podcast it went fast. Uh, to talk through these things. In fact, I think we have a podcast date. If you don't know his podcast, go to it. Awesome podcast, building, the Building Science Podcast. We've got a new one here at the Build Show uh, available. Carrier, big thanks, guys, uh, for Thank sponsoring you. today and for having some great information and being willing to tell tell everyone about the pros and the cons. You know, well, here's the downside of this unit, and here's some things yeah. you got to think about. I really appreciate that. That transparency uh, gives you a lot of trust in the builder community. Thanks for having uh, us. Uh, and you. I appreciate your friendship all these years, man, and pushing better technology and Absolutely. better equipment. It's mutual, my friend. Um, you know, as I've used a lot of this technology over the years and thought about how to move my houses beyond traditional systems to more efficient, more comfortable, more durable systems, I've had a lot of good manufacturer partners over the year, over the years. And working with a carrier on this project that has these units, it's been a fantastic partnership. They've got some great, very smart people. And if you don't already have a mechanical uh, designer and someone who's going to really design these systems for you. Think about that. Positive Energy is one of them. There's lots of others as well uh, out there in the nation. You want re a really good designed system and not just the guy with a bunch of flex duct uh, in the back <laughs> of the truck showing up to install uh, your systems and your zones. Guys, big thanks for joining us for this very nerdy and very uh, long Build Show Live. But this is a really great topic. I really appreciate your support, guys. If you're not currently uh, subscribing to The Build Show, hit that subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.